All right, welcome to today's online lecture. This is week 12, class number one, presentation strategies, questions, content, and tips. Welcome back from that extended uh, spring break. And uh, before we dive in, uh, just a few words about how we're gonna progress for the rest of this uh, semester. Just so that you know, uh, we've been working very hard to make sure that we can complete this semester, to make sure that we can give you the full educational experience um, that you signed up for. So uh, as we face these challenges, let's just commit to facing them together. It's gonna take a bit of effort, a bit of flexibility on everybody's part, especially in this class, especially in the senior seminar, where there are so many uh, different um, pieces to it and so many different moving parts. So I am going to adjust the uh, syllabus that's gonna come real soon. I'm gonna adjust the syllabus so that we can fit in the rest of this uh, semester. I am going to uh, put in some extra lectures if required. And uh, we are going to try to progress as normal as possible uh, and just address the concerns as they come up. So have faith that the concerns will be addressed. I am aware that there are students that still need to do their second presentation. You will have your opportunity to do that second presentation. Uh, I am aware that we do need to do online uh, presentations as well. So the undergraduate research conference, we're currently trying to save that. Check out the announcements for how you can do your part by submitting an abstract to showing uh, and show the committee that there is demand from the students for that. And then also, um, we are going to try to do an online conference. So you will still have the ability to uh, present. You will still have the ability to have that experience. Put that on your CV, gain that experience that will look great for employers and look great for uh, graduate schools. And uh, just everything else, we will adjust, we will overcome. Uh, this is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity to practice that idea of doing research and practice that idea of doing a project where you don't know the outcome. I'll be completely transparent. I don't know exactly how we're gonna handle all the details, but I know that we got the skills and the critical thinking ability to do it. So we will encounter challenges as we finish the rest of the semester. So I hope that you can join me. I hope that you can double down on uh, your effort for this most important uh, class of your academic career. And uh, we're gonna continue on and do our best so that you get the full experience, you can get have that full educational uh, experience going through this uh, semester. So on that note, we are gonna begin uh, day one of the face-to-face -face, uh, shutdown. And uh, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna take a look at presentation strategies, and we're gonna take a look at how to answer questions. We're gonna take a look at the content that you're gonna need for your oral presentation, whether you do it at the URC or whether we do it in class, which will now be whether you do it at a virtual version of the URC or whether you do it uh, via an online submitted recorded lecture, one or the other, details to come. But we're gonna talk about a very important aspect of that, which is how to deal with uh, questions. So we're gonna talk about a fundamental strategy for dealing with questions. We touched on this before the extended spring break, we are going to reiterate this because get this fundamental strategy down and the rest of it all makes sense. Get this fundamental strategy down and you will break the one habit that you need to break in order to be a excellent uh, presenter at answering questions. So we'll talk about that one fundamental strategy again. We're gonna review uh, answering questions part uh, one. Actually, we're gonna start this. We didn't get a chance to do this last time. We're gonna take a look at how to answer questions that fall under specific categories. Category number one, these are questions that have an answer. So we're gonna see that some questions can be answered, some questions cannot be answered. So if a question has an answer, that means that it can be answered. And then we're gonna take a look at subsets of those, the questions that you do have the answer to, what do you do in that case? And the ones that do have an answer, but you just don't know the answer to it, what do you do in that case? And then we're gonna take a look at a very important category of questions, and these are questions that do not have an answer. So there are questions that you can get asked at a conference during a presentation that just are unanswerable because of their very nature. Because of this, you cannot answer these questions. The most gifted psychologist in the world, the most intelligent and skilled psychologist in the world cannot answer these questions, and yet you still might encounter them 
So we're going to take a look at strategies for those different, uh, that fundamentally different category of question. We're also going to take a look at your general oral presentation guidelines so that you can start putting your presentation together. You can start pulling from your research and start pulling from your synthesis draft uh, in order to get the material for your presentation. And then we're going to circle back around to answering questions part two, where we're going to go into a little bit more detail about some of the kind of specific moves that you can make, those specific strategies you can have in your back pocket, ready to go. You're probably not going to have to use them, but if you do, know that they are, they are there in your arsenal and uh, readily available for you to be able to handle any question that comes your way. So these are going to be strategies that you can use to answer anything, any situation that you'll encounter at a uh, conference presentation. So we haven't seen this in a while, so let's revisit it one more time, uh, especially now that the journey has changed uh, slightly. But once again, this entire course, what we're doing here is the idea of going from nothing, maybe nothing but an idea, all the way down to a published article. So we are still committed, I am still committed to getting everybody in here published uh, in the uh, journal that I have uh, founded specifically for uh, in the journal uh, issues that are dedicated to student uh, research. It's our special spotlight on student issues or the SOS issues. So I'm dedicated to getting you to that point. Again, follow the plan, you will get there. That's the plan that we've uh, outlined before, we've taken a look at it before. And what we're gonna focus on today are the skills that you need for that part of it, for the conference talk, where you're gonna present your information uh, in a PowerPoint style presentation, and then uh, deal with questions uh, during the conference talk, and then also during the poster session. So we're also going to have to find a way to do a poster session. I really hope we can do that in a live version so that you can encounter live questions and have that experience of doing a live poster session. Uh, however, uh, regardless, you still need to know the skills on how to deal with a poster session so even if you don't do it in this class, even if we cannot attain that, you'll have the skills ready to go for any future poster session that you will give, any future presentation that you will give, whether it's in psychology or in another area that you uh, go into. So let's start taking a look at questions. And again, we'll start with the fundamental strategy. And this is something that you need to repeat to yourself over and over again uh, until it becomes ingrained until this becomes your default habit. And this is a good thing to remind yourself of every single time you step on that stage to give a presentation, every single time you come up to the podium, it is a good idea to remind yourself that you are under no obligation to answer the question that was actually asked. This goes against everything we've been brought up to do in our society. Uh, this, goes up, this goes against this fundamental phenomenon of reciprocity where you feel in a society you're obligated to fill certain social contracts. A question is a social contract. I ask a question, you provide the answer. That's the implied social contract. So I will repeat this again. In a conference presentation, you are under no obligation to answer the question that has been asked. And if you can get that into your mind, everything else that comes from this will flow much, much easier. So re repeat this as many times as you need. Have this as your first little note card if that's what you need. Uh, write this in your phone, send yourself a text message before. You are under no obligation to answer the question that has been asked to you. So how do we use this fundamental strategy uh, to navigate the question period of a conference presentation? Well, we're gonna start off with the easiest strategy and these have to do with questions that actually have an answer. So these are questions where an answer exists. These are questions that are answerable, right? So what is the sound of one hand clapping is not a question that has an answer, right? It's, it's basic premise is that it cannot be answered. So these are not those questions. These are questions that have an answer. These are questions like what is two plus two, right? Where you know, that the answer is for, and it actually does exist. So even if you don't know what the answer is, such as what is 13 squared, we know that the answer exists. So these are those types of questions, questions that have an answer. Things like what statistical uh, test did you use? 
Uh, how many subjects were in that study that you mentioned? Uh, what's your definition of sexual attraction, right? These are actual questions that do have answers. So the questions that have answers come in two subcategories. The first one, and this is the easiest one to deal with, these are questions that have answers and you have the answer. You actually know the information. So again, these are things like content questions, such as what is your definition for ADHD? Such as what was the organization that collected that information? Such as where were the uh, subjects from in that particular study? Were they from Haiti? Were they from uh, the Dominican Republic? What was, where were they from? And then also these include speculation type questions. Like what do you think you know, is important about this particular aspect? Uh, how do you think your conclusions would apply to this different situation? Uh, can you expand on what you, you know, mentioned before? So these are the type of questions that you will get. And these are really nice ones because you actually can answer these. And most often you will have an answer. So in terms of content, you're going to be the expert in your particular uh, project. You're going to know more about your project than anybody else in the world. So in terms of content, if you don't know the answer, they don't know the answer. So you will know more content than anybody else. And then speculation, you know more about your own speculation about what you believe than anybody else as well. So again, these are the questions that you can answer. So what are the strategies that we can use? Well, this one, I started with this one because it's the most fundamental one. It's the easiest one. It's the one that we automatically do. And the strategy is just answer the question. Just provide the person with a question. The follow-up strategy to this, though, is very, very important. And that is to use that as a springboard to engage with the person that is asking you the question. So, for example, if they ask you, oh, can you, you know, uh, where were the subjects? Uh, where did the subjects come from? for that one study that you mentioned. And if the answer is Germany, you want to first off say, oh, the subjects came from Germany, and then use that as a launching point to continue on with the discussion. Say something about what it might mean that these subjects came from Germany. Say something about what the culture there uh, might be like, what the university system there uh, might be like. Engage in the discussion with the person. Maybe ask them a follow-up question. Maybe ask them about, oh, um, you know, why uh, can I ask you why you asked that particular question? Do you think it might make a difference what culture it comes from? So this is almost like being the, the best analogy for this is being a guest on a talk show. So if you're a guest on a talk show, usually it's because you have a new movie to uh, promote. Usually it's because you have a new concert tour that you want to promote. And uh, the interviewer will ask you questions. And it's your job to run with it. It's your job to take that question and go and just provide content uh, for, you know, the interview. So when they ask you something like, oh, do you have a new movie coming out? You can't just say yes. And then stop. Right. It's true. You answer the question. But you want to make sure that you're using these opportunities to engage with your audience, engage with the person answering, asking the question. So do you have a new movie coming out? Yes, I do. It's called Presenting at the URC, and it stars, you know, me, and it stars Dr. Igor Yudichevic, and we had a great time working on it, and it was, you know, and then the virus came in, and we all were under quarantine, but then we overcame that, we all went online. Go launch into it, engage in that discussion. So if they ask you about the subjects, launch into something that was interesting about the subjects. If they ask you about a theory, launch into something that you think is particularly interesting about the theory ask them follow-up questions don't be afraid to engage with the person uh, that is asking the question because they're interested they want to talk to you about it so use that opportunity especially if you know the answer because kind of you know game within the game tips here the more time you spend on questions where you know the answer the less time they have to ask you other questions so it's almost a win-win situation here all right, so that's for questions that have an answer and you can answer. What about questions that have an answer and you cannot answer that? So these are ones, these are questions that do have an answer, such as where did those subjects come from? And you just don't know the answer. You just don't remember the answer or you didn't come across that information or maybe it wasn't reported. Uh, maybe they ask you a speculation question and you have no idea. 
So sure, there's an answer to that speculation, but you don't know what it is. You can't think about it on that moment. Let's say that your mind just totally goes blank on a particular question and you just cannot answer it. There are strategies that you can use. Strategy, uh, a few of them, uh, one of them is avoiding the question. And I'm starting with this one, but this is your absolute final, uh, um, final uh, tactic. This is your nuclear option. This is what you go to when everything else has failed. So I'm going to do this one first because I want you to know this is in your back pocket if you ever need it. And this is your no fail uh, option when everything else has, uh, has been used. This is the one strategy that you can use uh, and it ties directly into you do not need to answer the question. So if somebody asks you a question such as, well, where did your subjects come from? and you have no idea, and you feel that you need to answer this question, you can always avoid the question and use a statement like the following and say, you know what, that's a really interesting question. But I believe it touches on a more fundamental issue that needs to be addressed first. And that fundamental issue is, and then you talk about whatever you wanna talk about. You can talk about anything. That fundamental issue is your door to avoiding this question and talking about anything else. So if they're asking you about where the subjects came from, you can say, oh, that, that's uh, an interesting question. I believe it touches on a more fundamental issue, which is why this theory was tested in the first place. So if we take a look at why this theory was tested, what the researchers wanted to know is they wanted to know this and they wanted to know that. And then you just talk about whatever you want to talk about for the next few minutes. That is your nuclear option. That is your no fail final gasp attempt. Uh, in order to uh, address this situation. Uh, and that is in your back pocket. Keep it in your back pocket. I highly recommend practice this. Maybe look in the mirror, maybe try practicing this for a few rounds. Practice different segues. Interesting question. I believe it touches on a more fundamental issue. Interesting question, but I believe we first need to address this other issue related to it. Interesting question, uh, but I think that um, first we need to get very clear on this other particular issue. So try those different approaches. Try one that feels natural that you um, that you can go to and know that you have this option. Know that it is there so you don't have to fear any question ever because you can avoid any question ever. This is your bulletproof vest so that you can just run in there and be fully confident that you're going to be able to deflect any question that comes your way. So that's your nuclear option. A slightly less, um, a slightly less uh, extreme uh, version of this, but another strategy that you can use is just to admit not knowing. Uh, I've used this over and over and over again, uh, especially as I've become more comfortable presenting, and you will be surprised how well this goes over. So if you just admit to not knowing, if you just say something like, man, that is an interesting question, I actually haven't really thought about that. I'm not sure what the answer is, but it's definitely something that I'm going to look into. That is completely valid, and you will be surprised at how much that works. That works for two big, big reasons. Number one, uh, the person is uh, interested in knowing an answer to this question and saying something like, you know, I'll definitely look into it. Saying something like, you know, oh, that's a great question. That's something I hadn't thought of before gives them the feeling that they have contributed meaningfully to your research. They have brought up something that you haven't thought before. They've, they've given you a contribution. And just like giving somebody a gift always makes the giver feel good, they've given you a gift. They've said, hey, look at this part of your project. Did you ever think about this? And if your answer is no, I haven't, then to them, they've just become a part of your project. They've given you this very nice gift. So that is one reason why this goes over very, very well. The other reason is that people like others that are very similar to them. And the reason they're asking this question is because they don't know the answer. So if it turns out that you don't know the answer, well, guess what? That's just something that you two have in common. And it's almost like finding out that your favorite movie is somebody else's favorite movie. It's almost impossible not to increase your liking for that individual. So those are two things that are working for you. One, they've meaningfully, meaningfully contributed to your work. Two, they got something in common with you. They've asked you a question because they don't know. Turns out you don't know either. 
So both of those come across very, very well. Seriously consider this one. If you ever don't have the answer, just admit it. Just say, you know what? Very interesting question. I'm not sure. And then follow it up by, by uh, reassuring them that it's important and you're going to take a look at it. You know, so, oh, yeah, no, that's definitely something I'm going to look into. That's a very interesting question. I never thought about it that way. That's something that I think could really, you know, help out in, you know, this area. Do that kind of, you know, and practice that. And these two strategies will get you out of any question where you don't have the answer to. So, again, these are questions that have a real answer, but they don't actually, uh, they're, they're not actually, uh, you're not actually able to answer them because you, at this point, uh, don't have the answer. All right, so those are how to handle questions that do have an actual answer. The last category are going to be questions that do not have an answer. Questions that, by their very nature, just don't come with an answer, such as, what is the sound of one hand clapping? There is no answer to that. Uh, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? There is no answer to that. So because there's no answer, you literally cannot answer this, right? It's impossible to answer a question that has no answer. So what are some of the strategies that you can use for this? Well, before we get into the strategies, it's important to know uh, what type of questions cannot be answered. So what are the type of questions that you might encounter in a conference presentation that just don't have any answers to them? So some of the categories of this are things like absolute, uh, absolute questions. So questions like, well, how can you know for sure? How can you tell for sure? How do you know that the previous theories are actually true? How do you know that, um, basically, uh, oftentimes it's a, how do you know for sure question? So, you know, will this conclusion work for every uh, instance? These are absolute questions and they are very uh, difficult to answer because they don't have an answer. So how do you know for sure? You don't, you just, you can't know for sure. There's no answer to that. There's no answer to how can you do that when it cannot be done. So that's one of the uh, types of questions. Other ones are exception questions. Questions such as like, well, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm this way. So how does your, you know, and that's an exception to what you just said. So if we say something about people with ADHD and how they're more likely to, you know, have trouble socially, somebody could always say, well, you know, I have a cousin and they have ADHD and they're the life of the party. So how does your theory uh, attain for that? Or, or how does your theory account for that? So these are the kind of exception questions, kind of anecdote questions. Uh, these are, again, the questions that just do not come with an answer. And we've, also, we've already kind of touched on this for the absolute questions. But those how can you be sure questions, like how can you be sure that your conclusions are correct? How can you be sure that the, the theories that you pulled from are actually uh, true theories? Uh, how can you be sure about anything? And those are particularly unanswerable because you cannot be sure. You can never be 100% sure. There is nothing in science that we are 100% sure about uh, that we know will not change in the future. And uh, that is just part and parcel of the, the scientific enterprise. We cannot be sure any more than, you know, your, uh, the example I like to use for this is picking up your friend at the airport. Your friend could ask you, hey, can you pick me up at the airport? I'm flying in on Friday. And you can say, yes, I'll be there. And your friend can say, are you sure? And you say, yeah, I'm sure. And they'll be like, are you really sure? And you might say, yeah, I'm really sure. And they might say, are you absolutely sure? And you might like say, yeah, I'm absolutely sure. And they might say, are you absolutely, positively, without that exception, you know, super, super sure? And at some point, you're going to have to say, well, no, I cannot be that sure. Because something might happen, right? You might get hit with a meteor on the way to the to the airport. Uh, the flight might get canceled. Uh, Friday might, uh, might skip over directly into Saturday. I don't know, anything can happen, right? We go straight from Thursday to Friday. Who knows? The point is though, is that you can never be 100% sure. So a question like that cannot have an answer because the, the answer is that you can't. So how can you be sure? The answer is that you can't. So how do we deal with these types of questions? Because oftentimes these come up and the people that are asking them don't know that they don't have an answer. The people that are posing this question don't realize that they're asking something that's an impossibility. So one of the ways that you can do or the strategies that you want to do, this is multi-step, is you want to acknowledge the truth of the question. So how can you be sure? You want to acknowledge that, well, we cannot 
be sure. Um, are you absolutely sure that this will work for every case? Uh, no, we are not absolutely sure that this can work for every case. Uh, you know, I have a cousin who's an exception to your theory. You, yes, you absolutely have a cousin that's an exception to the theory. Yes, that behavior that they display is absolutely an exception to the theory. So acknowledge the truth of the question. Uh, bring them on board. Say, yes, you know, what you just stated, that is absolutely true. And then, and this is the important part, bring it back to your main point. So that is absolutely true. However, our theory suggests this. That is absolutely true. However, my conclusions point to this. That's absolutely true. However, bring it back. In general, forget your exceptions. In general, it works like this. The conclusions work like this. The application works like this. So acknowledge the truth. Yes, it's true. And then bring it back. But in general, according to these theories, according to the research, according to my conclusions, here's what it's all about. So that's the second step. Or you can use a different tactic, and that is to speculate about the question. So acknowledge the truth of the question. Oh, that's very interesting about your, your cousin and his behaviors. You know what? That actually might have to do with, and then speculate about it. You know, speculate about uh, the idea that, you know, this might not apply to everybody. Uh, speculate about the fact that we can't be absolutely sure. Uh, and that kind of indicates that there might be other factors that, that, you know, come into play here. There might be other areas of psychology that need to be looked at in order to completely explain what I was trying to contribute to. So again, acknowledge the truth of the question. Let them know that what they ask is, is a, a real, a true question. Even though it doesn't have an answer, let them know, yes, what you brought up is true. The point that you brought up is valid. And then either A, and this is my favorite one, bring it back to your main point. Just redirect them back to what we can know. Redirect them back to what your work actually indicates. Or two, speculate about the question. Uh, let them know, you know, and just use it as a launching pad once again to talk about issues that the question might bring up. So those are uh, the basic strategies that we're uh, going over for uh, how to answer a question. So again, questions that have answers, content and speculation. If you know it, answer it. Uh, and um, uh, use that to launch into a discussion. If you don't know it, nuclear option, change it to another fundamental issue that you do, uh, do uh, can discuss, or admit that you're wrong, uh, or sorry, admit that you don't know, and uh, mention that you'll take a look at it. And again, that increases liking because you're very similar to the person asking the question, and they've contributed to your particular study. And then questions that do not have an answer, Follow the two-step strategy, acknowledge the truth, and bring it back to the main point, or acknowledge the truth and use it as a springboard to speculate about your particular question. All right, so that was questions. Now let's switch gears to what you do before people are asking the questions, which is your general presentation. So this is gonna be the presentation guidelines for the um, uh, for the now soon to be online oral presentation that you will give. So this is the PowerPoint like presentation that you'll give. This is part of the reason why we did the student presentations up to this point so that you could gain some experience, so you could gain some uh, some skills and familiarity with giving a presentation. So let's go through some of these general guidelines that will guide you uh, in your presentation. So the first one <clears throat> is that in your presentation, you need to present everything. You need to present your entire project. So you need to present your phenomenon. You need to present the perception section. It says visual perception, but uh, it could be whatever perception you are using. So present your phenomenon. What is the area? What is the question of interest that you're looking at to answer? Visual, uh, sorry, your perception section. What are the kind of perceptual phenomenon that are important to know? diversity section, what is the characteristics of your population that are important to know, and then your synthesis analysis, how does it all work together, how does the argument flow from this is the perception, this is the diversity, and if these two are true, therefore, this is the outcome of that. So the bottom line here, and this is why it's guideline number one, you have to present the full story. You got to present it from the beginning to the end. You need to present something from each section of your 
uh, of your paper. Now, guideline 1B touches on the fact that you, only, you are only going to have about 12 minutes to present this information. So rather than trying to cram everything into 12 minutes and presenting so much stuff that your, your listener loses this, the flow of the story and your listener checks out and your listener forgets your presentation as soon as you're done, rather than doing that, we're going to go to general guideline 1B, and that is to only present one to two major ideas. So these are also known as take-home ideas. So you might, you've done a lot of work in your research paper, sorry, your research study. And all of that work is going to be on display in the research paper. So when you hand in that final paper, I will know the 20, 30, 40 articles that you, uh, that you went through. I will know all the details and all the things that you've learned, you know, for your senior seminar project. That works in a research paper where I have an hour to sit down there and go through it and digest it at my speed. For a presentation, it's not the person's speed. It's your speed that dictates it. And you don't have an hour, you have 12 minutes. So because of that, you wanna only present one to two major ideas. So go to your, uh, go to your study and think about what is the one thing that you want somebody to walk away knowing from your presentation? What's the one conclusion, one idea from your synthesis section that you want that person or need that person to walk away knowing and then you build your entire presentation around that. So think about the one conclusion that they want, uh, that you want them to leave with, and then the entire presentation is built to get you to that conclusion, to point to that conclusion, to give you that path to that conclusion, and that is all that you present. So your hours of work will be in the research paper, but you gotta condense that down to a 12 minute digestible presentation. And you do that by choosing that one or two conclusions that you want to, them to walk away with, that you want them to take home, those take home ideas, and build your presentation pointing towards those one to two ideas. So how do we build that presentation? Well, guideline number two, we start with your phenomenon. So start with the question that you are asking. Start with the, you know, does sexual attraction uh, imply uh, reproduction? Uh, does attention deficit disorder uh, imply, um, or, or is it connected to, uh, um, you know, social media use? Uh, are firefighters more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease later on? Start with the phenomenon that you're looking at, uh, and then you want to link it to something big. You want to link it to something important. So if the phenomenon, let me back that up a little bit with the firefighters, if the phenomenon has to do with the development of Alzheimer's disease, that's a kind of, um, that's a bit of a nebulous subject. That's a bit of a hypothetical situation. But if you can link it to something real, such as firefighters who have gone through traumatic experiences like 9-11, who have gone through uh, and developed post-traumatic stress disorder, and now are perhaps at risk for developing Alzheimer's, if you can link it to something big in our culture, something big in people's minds, uh, that is going to be very effective in helping them remember what it is that you talked about. So after you present the phenomenon, link it to something big, link it to some big social issue. And because of the nature of your topics, that will not be very difficult to do. All of you have chosen very interesting, uh, very uh, sort of hot button topics. So it's not gonna to be too difficult to link it to something big, but make sure that you do. Make sure that you start with the phenomenon, start with the description of what it is that you're gonna be looking at uh, in very layman terms, and then link it to something big. A corollary of this is you never start with theories. So do not ever just launch into, you know, here's a theory of Alzheimer's disease. Do not ever just launch into, well, here's your definition for post-traumatic stress disorder. Don't ever just start with the theories because your audience is not ready for it. Your audience is not mentally prepared. You're going to hit them in the face with theories. It's going to come out of nowhere. And when things come out of nowhere, your audience checks out. And when your audience checks out, it's hard to get them back. So if you just launch into, oh, well, you know, perspective geometry is the projection of a, a 3D uh, world onto a 2D plane uh, using the intersection of a conical series, you're gone, right? If I started that way for a presentation, 
everybody in that room has already mentally checked out. Nobody's going to listen to the rest of my presentation. But if I start off with a phenomenon and I say, hey, if you look at a perspective picture, like this picture of the School of Athens by Raphael, ooh, look at how good that picture looks, right? It looks very realistic. You can see the space in that picture. Start with the phenomenon. Everybody will get on board. And then once you have the phenomenon, uh, bring in the theories. That's when you bring in the theories. So you never want to start with the theories. A very related guideline, guideline 2D, is that you never ever want to start with the theories. And I'm emphasizing this because oftentimes this is the mistake students make. I think that theories sometimes are very difficult to, uh, to process. Theories sometimes are very difficult to, uh, to learn and learn well enough that you are confident in presenting them. So I kind of feel that once students do that, you're so rightfully proud of what you've accomplished that you almost can't wait to tell somebody about it, right? It's like when you're a little kid and you just did your first cartwheel, right? You are just dying to tell anybody about that cartwheel and you're dying to show it off. I think that's what might happen sometimes with students doing some of their first presentations. You've worked hard on your study. You've worked hard on your research. You've gone over these theories over and over again until you were rock solid on those theories. And it's almost like you've got to tell somebody about this monumental feat that, that you have accomplished and you will, you absolutely will, but not at the beginning because they're not ready. They're not ready for it. So make sure that you get them ready for it. Start with the phenomenon, link it to something big, and then hit them over the head with that theory that they're then ready for, and then impress the heck out of them uh, once they can understand what you're talking about. So that was for uh, general guideline number three. You do present theories, but you're gonna do them at the right time. And a related guideline to this, and this ties into that 12 minutes, is that when you're presenting theories, don't present any non-essential information. Don't present any sort of nuances in the theory that might be important to a specialist in that area, but are not required for the work that you're doing right now. So try to boil down your theory to the essential points. Try to boil down the theory to the brass tacks. Do not... Um, just present your theories uh, wholesale. Uh, boil it down for the reader. You've done the hard work to try to understand these theories. Help your, uh, not your reader, help your audience out by doing that hard mental work for them, by giving, that, not giving them that nice synopsis so that they can mentally process that information. And you do that by cutting out any non-essential information. How do you know if it's not essential? It's not essential if you don't need to know it for your conclusion. So once again, go back to that guideline number one. What are your one to two main points? And when you're explaining your theory, take a look at it and say, out of these six things in this theory, which ones do I need for this one point to make sense? Which ones do I need for my one conclusion? And if you only need three out of the six, only provide three out of the six. So take a look at your theories critically and think to yourself, what can I cut out? What don't I need to go into in detail in order for this theory to make sense for my audience? All right, general guideline number four, uh, you do want to present data to back up some of your claims. So as you're talking about theories, it is a good idea to kind of put up graphs uh, from uh, the studies that you're looking at. Uh, put up uh, conclusions from studies that you looked at. Put up uh, some numbers from studies that you looked at. Um, do make sure that you explain those. So there were a couple of instances in the student presentations where students would, uh, where people, presenters put up graphs and said, oh, and here's a graph from the study. And then they just went on. Or, oh, here's a table. And then they just went on. So do use those, present the tables, present the graphs. It gives authority and believability to the statements that you're making. But make sure that you do present that data. And when you present that data, you want to mention the results and you do not want to mention statistics. Do not go into any of the statistics that your studies used to get to the results that they had. So we're very interested in the final conclusions. We're very interested in the final results. It is a very rare person that is actually interested in the statistics. So do not feel obligated to present the statistics whatsoever. If somebody's interested in the statistics, they will ask you during that question period. And if you don't know the answer to this to the statistics questions, tell them that there's a more fundamental issue that you need to address first and then dive into that. So, uh, but the point is, is do not present your statistics. 
when when researchers do that when presenters do that it goes i'll be honest with you boring really quickly and again viewers will check out audience members will check out and it's hard to get them back on board all right so that was for the um the phenomenon so again uh the these presentation guidelines they apply to the visual perception uh portion they provide prov um, apply to the diversity portion as well guideline number five when you're presenting your uh synthesis section present your conclusions present what you concluded and then walk your audience through an example so make sure that if your conclusion is that firefighters are at a greater risk for developing alzheimer's disease uh, later in life present that present the conclusion through your research and then say this is how it all works firefighters go through traumatic experiences they develop post-traumatic stress disorder they get prescribed antidepressant drugs antidepressant drugs have been shown to increase chances for alzheimer's therefore so walk your audience through that example drag them through take it step by step and a, a critical thinking intelligent intelligent audience member will be able to do this on their own but again we don't want to burden the audience because that's your invitation for them to check out we want to make sure that they understand this we want to take them by the hand and guide them through walk your audience through that example and then when you're presenting the synthesis section uh when you're ending your presentation present some implications and applications bring this back to the real world bring this back to how would you help real people with what you know uh, what are some of the implications of what you concluded for the real world for social policy for the educational system for the justice system for social media for teenage adolescent uh, counseling, tie it into something important again, because that's the way that you kind of leave your, your audience with that feeling of, ooh, what I just watched, wow, that is an important thing to remember. I better remember it. And your presentations will have more impact for it. So leave them with a big sort of like, and here's something super important, and uh, that will increase the impact of your presentations. All right, general guideline number six do not read your slide so this is something that is very uh difficult to do because reading is highly automatic and you are very tempted and it's occurred oftentimes in the presentations as well students are very uh, tempted to read your slide professional presenters are very tempted to read your slide but you do not want to read a slide so do not read your slide reading from a slide is boring Reading from a slide makes the audience wonder, why do we need to be here? Reading from the slide encourages the audience to read ahead, as most of you probably did when you were looking at this slide. So instead of having a slide that is this text heavy, which will tempt you to read it, and I will admit it's very difficult to have a slide that is this text heavy, that has everything on it that you wanna say and not read from it. So what you wanna to do to stop yourself from doing that is to have a slide that looks like this. Have a slide that presents the bullet points. And then you will not be able to just read from your slide. So if I was to tell you why it's important not to read from your slide, I could have a slide like this up, up on the screen and say, you know what, reading from a slide is boring, right? You get a monotone going, you, you don't engage with your audience. It's very boring to read from a slide. And at the same time, your audience is gonna start wondering, well, why do we need to be here? We could have just downloaded the PowerPoint files uh, and did this in the comfort of my own home. Why did I get dressed up you know, and drive all the way here if all this person is gonna do is read from a slide? And it also encourages your audience to read ahead. So the whole time you're presenting, they're not, they're not with you. They're not listening to what you're saying. They're looking ahead to what they're reading. So notice that I have presented all the information on this slide, but I have done it in a way that didn't encourage me to read from the particular slide. So have it in your notes. If you're not um, comfortable enough by doing a non-written out uh, presentation, have that in your notes. But I would highly encourage you to create your slides to look like this, where each of these points is a cue so that you don't forget what you wanna talk about. Each of these points is a way of reminding you of what your next point should be. 
So boring. Oh, yes, that's right. I'm going to talk about how reading from a slide is boring. Why do we need to be here? Oh, right. That's what the audience wonders if you're reading from a slide. Reading ahead. Oh, right. That's what an audience will do automatically. They'll read ahead. So use those points that you present on the screen as cues, memory cues for you to recall what you want to talk about. Have your notes there as a backup option, but really try this. I mean, practice this at home when you're putting your presentation together to see what you can take off of the slide and just have those cues to let you know what it is that you are uh, going to present on. All right, guideline number seven, use graphs, figures, and pictures whenever possible. So this is actually something that I've been very pleased with. This is something that has been done very well in the, uh, in the presentation so far. And uh, continue to do it. Continue to use graphs, continue to use figures, continue to use pictures. Pictures are worth a thousand words. It really is true. And they're much more engaging. We come especially now from a very visual culture. We've all grown up on YouTube and Instagram. We expect pictures with our information. And we've had this since we were children, right? So when you're a child, the books that you read, they're picture books. You have a nice big picture and a little bit of text, right? You have a nice big picture of a girl uh, traveling in the woods. And underneath you have Goldilocks, you know, found the cabin in the woods that belonged to the three bears. So it works for children. Why do we ever stop doing this for adults? Why do we make it so much harder for adults? Don't do that. So when you're talking about, for example, depression, you could put up this text slide here and this this has all the information you need depression a mental disorder characterized by episodes of all-encompassing low mood accompanied by low self-esteem and loss of interest or pleasure in normally enjoyable activities notice again this goes back to my previous point i just read that whole slide not engaging and i was very tempted to do it and i fell for it i read the whole slide much better is to have something that looks like this you know what depression is put up a picture of somebody that's depressed and people will immediately say, oh, I get it. And then launch into, oh, depression is characterized by a low mood for a prolonged period of time. You can have this in your notes. It doesn't have to be on the screen. So give them something to look at. Make your presentations like a picture book. I do this regularly for my presentations and people are on board and people love it because you would think about your own reactions. You would much rather not see something like this and rather look at something like this and have the person explain it to you. So use these images to your advantage uh, and then offload the text onto your notes if you need. Use the PowerPoint notes uh, as another option as well. Uh, it doesn't need to be on the screen. And again, that'll help you not read from the screen, which will make your presentations more engaging. All right, 7B, if you're using pictures, make them as big as possible. So you got space, you got space on your screen Try not to design your slides like this. So this is a lot of text with a very small little picture. I would much rather not see this. I would much rather be at a presentation where they have something like this. So once again, take advantage of the fact that you got a nice big screen that you can put nice big images up there and don't have these slides that are, you know, these small little images with a lot of text. I would rather a much larger image go full screen Maybe put in a little text box there uh, if you need to have that text up there, but try to make your presentation, your uh, images as big as possible. So if you have a graph and you have a presentation title for your, you know, for that slide, ask yourself, do I really need that presentation title? Or do I have an opportunity to make my graph a little bit bigger, a little bit easier for people to, uh, to see, especially people in the back row, right? So make your graphs as big as possible. Make your graphs as easy to see as possible. And then, you know, once you kind of have the layout, and this is just a little tip that I like to do. This is just something that I like to uh, incorporate in my presentations. Make your slide just as pretty as possible. Make Try to make them look good. And it's just little things. So go through your slide and take a look at little things that might be a little bit aesthetically unpleasing. So for example, I have a bar at the top of all of my slides that has Indiana University South Bend and then the name of my research lab, Paladin Sane Research. And you can see that when I've made this figure as large as possible, it's, it's cut that off. What I usually like to do because that's visually jarring is I like to cover that up with uh, just a white uh, square. So I'll draw a white square, I'll put it in the back, uh, I'll move it to the back, I'll move the, the slide, uh, the, 
graph to the front and uh, it just looks better. So again, little touches like that make it flow easier, doesn't, you know, makes people less distracted and um, it's just an uh, easier way to digest your information. All right, still on the uh, subject of pictures. Uh, make sure that your uh, graphs and your figures in your picture illustrate your point. And this is something that a lot of you encountered when you were doing your article synopses, where you would put up graphs, figures, and pictures that pre uh, presented information that wasn't necessary. So you were focusing on a particular part of your uh, study that you were summarizing, but you put up a graph of all of the results of the study, and that's very distracting. So for example, if I was doing a presentation and I just wanted to talk about associated and unassociated words, that's what I wanted to drive home. That's what I wanted to talk about from this study. I might have this graph here from the study that shows associated words, unassociated words, word then non-word, non-word then word, and two non-words. And I might not be interested in those final three categories. I just want to present on associated words and unassociated words. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to make sure that my graph proves my point. And if I'm trying to prove the point that there is a difference in reaction time between associated and unassociated words, this figure is horrible. This is a bad figure because visually it doesn't prove my point. Visually, it does not look like there's a difference between associated and unassociated words. What I would want to do is I would want to modify that graph. I would want to use the numbers from the, uh, from the study and modify the graph so it does prove my point. And you can modify it by messing around with the scales of the axes. So if I increase the axes, now all of a sudden there is a visual difference between associated and unassociated words. Now all of a sudden when I say, oh, there is a difference between the reaction time for associated and unassociated words, people will look at that picture and say, I see it. I get it. That makes sense. This, I don't see it. I'm confused. This, oh yes, I see it. I make sense. This, I don't see it. I'm checking out of this presentation. This, I absolutely see it. I'm going to stay in this presentation. And even better than this, get rid of any information that you do not need. Get rid of any information that you're not presenting because you chose your one to two main points that you're going to focus on and you don't need to present information about the entire study. So again, if all I wanted the audience to do was to know that unassociated words had higher reaction times than associated words, I wouldn't want to use this graph. I would modify it and I would use this graph. So use Photoshop or similar image processing programs. Uh, make your own graphs in Excel based on the data from the, uh, from the articles. Make sure that the images that you use uh, are um, uh, showing the point that you're trying to make. All right, so present your graphs and figures and pictures before discussing your point. This is also something that some of you uh, didn't do in your um, in-class presentations, and that is to show the picture first and then tell them about the picture. So if I was on this slide right now and I said, oh, uh, associated words had faster reaction times than unassociated words, as you can see here in this graph, that's backwards. What you want to do is you want to first show the graph and say, oh, let's take a look at this data here and then say, as you can see, right? Remember that phrase, as you can see in this graph, associated words and unassociated words, you know, are significantly different. So again, uh, show it first and then explain to them what they're looking at. Don't do it in the reverse. Otherwise, you're going to say your point. You're going to say something like, Associated words have faster reaction times than unassociated words. Uh, here's a graph. And then you're going to move on. So present it, uh, present the picture first, and then explain to the audience what it is that they're seeing. All right, guideline number eight, use as little text as possible. This is massively important. People don't want to read. Uh, they don't want to read, and they definitely don't want to read a lot. And they definitely don't want to sit there and be read to for a while. And I have heard audible groans in presentations when somebody puts up a slide that looks like this. If you put up a slide that looks like this, the audience knows that they are in for five to six minutes of this slide. 
they are in for five to six minutes of somebody just reading off of this slide and they will mentally check out. They will mentally say, you know what? I don't have the time for this. I just, you know, I'm going to check my phone. I'm going to do something else. This is not a good graph. It's way too much text information and also massively frustrating if you're anywhere but the first two rows. Because if you see something on a, on a screen and you can't read it, but you know it's there, that is incredibly frustrating. And you do not want to frustrate your audience. So make sure that your font is big enough. And the way that you do that is by not presenting or not using that much text. So if I'm going to talk about depression and the subtypes of depression, melancholic depression, atypical depression, seasonal affective disorder, I put up a, a slide like this, my audience is going to check out. I put up a slide like this and I start talking about depression. I start talking about depression is associated with low mood. It's a mental illness uh, characterized by low mood over prolonged periods of time. And then you can say other things like, let's go into the subtypes of depression. For example, here are some of the subtypes of depression. There's melancholic depression. There's atypical depression, catatonic depression, seasonal affective disorders characterized by these you know, symptoms. And even better than this one, because this encourages reading ahead, you could do something like this. You could say, let's talk about the subtypes of depression. There's melancholic depression. It has these following characteristics. Another type is atypical depression, which has these particular characteristics. Different than that is catatonic depression, which is different from postpartum depression. And then finally, we have seasonal affective disorder, which has all of these particular characteristics. So those slides are much more engaging. And we have no limit whatsoever on the number of slides that you can have. You have no limit. You don't have to print these up. Making a presentation with a thousand slides costs just as much as making a presentation with only a hundred. So feel free to spread your information across multiple slides to make it visually engaging and to ensure that your audience is going to stay with you and not read ahead. And that ties right into guideline 8B, which is to introduce the text idea by idea. So once again, if we put up this slide here, by the time I'm talking about atypical depression, people are already reading about seasonal affective disorder. And they're not listening to all the interesting, engaging stuff that I need them to know about atypical uh, depression. I have this slide up here because they need to know this information. So if they're distracted by looking at and reading ahead, they're missing out on vital information that they need to know. So a better way to do this is to bring it in animated and bring it in and say, you know what, we're going to talk about the subtypes of depression. First one, melancholic depression. Here are the characteristics. This is what it typically involves. Next, we have atypical depression. Here are its characteristics. Notice that the audience has to be with you. There's no way they can read ahead because you haven't put up that information yet. And then you follow up with catatonic depression. And when you're talking about catatonic depression, everybody in the audience is listening to you about catatonic depression because that's the only thing they can do. They cannot read ahead. Postpartum depression and then seasonal affective disorder, much better to animate the information as you present it to keep your audience on board so that they don't miss that vital information that you have selected for them, that critical stuff that they absolutely need to know. All right, guideline number nine. Uh, you're going to be doing PowerPoint or some other presentation software. You can use whatever presentation software you like. I use PowerPoint as sort of like a generic term for presentation software, but you want to use a simple PowerPoint template. So feel free, absolutely free, to download the lecture slides and use my presentation template. This is an incredibly simple presentation template. And one of the reasons you want to use a simple presentation template is because you don't want too much visual clutter. You don't want too much distraction from your, uh, from your point, from your visual impact. And then the other reason is that this presentation is a very high contrast presentation, which means that it will work well in just about every presenting situation you will encounter at a conference. So going to a conference, sometimes you don't know what the presentation resources are going to be. Is it going to be projected on a screen? Is it going to be shown on a big screen TV? And you don't know the conditions of the room. Will the room be brightly lit? Will the room have shadows in it? 
Uh, I was in a uh, conference presentation just recently where my room had windows that allowed the sun in, the very bright sun at the particular point of time when I was presenting. And a high contrast slide like this can still easily be seen. When you go into more complicated types of slides, then you start taking your chances. So here, depending upon the uh, capabilities of the projector or the characteristics of the TV, you might not be able to very easily read my presentation title, yellow on brown, right? You might not be able to see that, which means immediately, right off the bat, you're frustrating your audience and they will check out. So, you know, try to use high contrast uh, presentation uh, type. So this is another example of a nice one, you know, white on black, this would work rather well. And there are some that, you know, are aesthetically pleasing. Um, this one's not that bad. However, the fancier you get, the more likely you are to run into issues. So the default graph for this presentation here looks like this. And those bars do not have enough contrast. And people, you will take a very high chance that you will be standing in front of this slide explaining to the audience what they should be able to see, apologizing for the fact that they can't see it, and basically saying, well, you know, the, the graph, I mean, if you could see it, Oh, look at the, the data there is amazing. All oh, the results from this implications are huge. And all they're going to be thinking about is what's up with this graph? I can't see it. Once again, mentally checked out. So again, feel free to use uh, the presentation uh, templates uh, from the uh, student lectures. So you can just download those and just put in your new slides, delete my slides out, put in all your new slides and it will carry over that presentation um, style uh, or find one that you like of your own. You don't have to use the one that uh, is provided, uh, but just make sure that you take into consideration the fact that it needs to be visible uh, under a wide variety of situations. All right, guideline number nine. We talked about introducing information piece by piece using PowerPoint animations. Do not get carried away with your PowerPoint animations. Make sure that you use simple PowerPoint animations, animations that don't distract from your presentation. You're supposed to be the star of this show. The information that you're presenting and the visuals that you put together are supposed to be the star of the show. You want the content to be the most important thing, not the kind of flair around it. So if your flair is taking away from your presentation, you want to make sure that you simplify it. And animations are one of those kind of pieces of flair that could take away from it. So when you're presenting on subtypes of depression, first we have melancholic depression. See how great that was? Nice, introduced, very simple. Then we have atypical depression. Follow that up with catatonic depression, postpartum depression. And lastly, we have seasonal affective disorder. That sequence worked very well because those are very simple animations. So fade is a particularly good one that I like to use. Uh, dissolve is a good one. Uh, wipe is good for text. Uh, so think about using those animations and do not do something like this where you're like, uh, you're talking about, oh, subtypes of uh, depression. Include things like melancholic depression. All right, that was kind of cool, kind of a little whoosh in there. And then we have things like atypical depression. And we also have the category of catatonic depression. And then there's postpartum depression. And then finally, we have, um, we just, um, it's uh, seasonal, effect, effective disorder, SAD. All right, look how horrible that last one was. So not only were the first four kind of distracting, the last one took forever. So don't use really complicated PowerPoint presentations, uh, sorry, PowerPoint animations. Use them for what they're meant to do to control the flow of information. Don't let them distract from the actual information that you're presenting. And definitely practice them with the timings because you do not want to sit there while your animation is running through. And uh, once again, the audience will check out and you will be up on the on the stage waiting for that information to uh, to finish. All right, 
And then general guideline uh, number 10, once you're done with your presentation, ask the audience if they have any questions or comments. Uh, ask them about, uh, and, and put that in a slide. Have a slide that literally just says questions. You know, just a big text box that says questions. Have a, have a slide that says any questions. Have a slide that says question period, whatever you like. Let them know that it's time and ask them, you know, do you have any questions about what you've uh, seen here? Or, or, you know, does anybody have any questions about, you know, the research that I'm doing? Ask them and that'll open up the question uh, period. So at this point, uh, what I want you to think, do, because we're going to uh, circle back around and look at questions one more time, is uh, try to identify going into your presentation questions that you have concerns about. So oftentimes, people going into a presentation will be worried about being asked certain questions, usually because either they feel unprepared for that question or they, they know it's a question that has no answer, no correct answer. So I would encourage you to think about these questions, maybe write them down, write down four or five questions that you do not wanna be asked, right? These are the questions where you're, where you're going up there and you're like, please don't let anybody ask me these questions. And then practice answering those questions, practice uh, the techniques that we're about to go over uh, one more time and elaborate on, practice those on those questions and know that you have, for the questions that you fear the most, you have strategies in place that you have practiced that are good to go, that are gonna help you out with uh, these questions. So once again, uh, answering questions, we're gonna take a look, we're gonna uh, break this down a little bit more. This is part two of our answering questions um, series. So steps to answering a question, make sure that you do these, uh, these uh, steps as you go through. Uh, and uh, it'll help you answer the question every single time. So step number one, listen to the whole question. And this is something that we as a culture are not particularly good at doing. Oftentimes when we are talking, when we're in a conversation, rather than listening to what the person is saying, we are wondering what's the next thing that we're gonna say. How are we gonna answer this? How are we gonna jump into this conversation? This is something that you can get uh, uh, into a habit of doing and it's not good in a, in a conference presentation. So if somebody starts asking you a question, your mind will, will start to think of, oh, I'm gonna answer that. How am I gonna answer it? What's the answer to that? Try to fight against that and listen to the whole question. So do not interrupt, let them talk. If they go on a tangent, let them go on a tangent. If they start you know, telling you a two minute story about their cousin with autism, let them tell the two minute story, do not interrupt. If they're absolutely just overtaking the, pres uh, the question period, your moderator will step in. Your moderator will be the one that says, oh, can we, you know, can we get to the question? Can you speed this along? Because we have other people that want to ask questions. It's not your place. So do not interrupt. Just let them talk. Just sit there in silence. Nod your head every once in a while. Show them that you're listening. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. You know, do a little bit of that, but do not interrupt. Let them finish. Step number two, think of the answer. So once they're done talking, think of the answer that you're going to give them. And don't be afraid to take time when you think of the answer. And we'll talk about why in just a moment. So think of the answer. And then step three, tell them the answer. So give them the answer to that particular question. So that's your basic strategy. And notice that this is your steps to answering a question when there is an answer and you have the answer, right? So listen to the whole question. Don't interrupt. Once they're done, stand, stand there in silence. Think of the answer and then just simply tell them the answer. And if you can't get to step three or sorry, if you can't complete step two, if you can't think of the answer, remember the strategies that you have. So strategy number one, if you can't think of an answer immediately, uh, pause and think you would be surprised how effective this is. If somebody asks you a question and says, well, what do you think is, uh, what do you think an implication, you know, of your theory is for the public library system? You'd be amazed at how effective it is just to sit there and go, oh, hmm, let me think. And then take all the time that you need. Take the time that you need to come up with a, with a question. This is not a game show where you have a certain limited amount of time before you need to answer that question. There's no clock that's ticking before they'll buzz you 
in a you know in a conference presentation. So pause and think, and have confidence in the fact that silence actually makes you look more intelligent. So if you look like you're thinking, they're going to believe your answer more. If you look like you're thinking, you're going to come across as a critical thinking, intelligent scientist, and that's a win-win for everybody. So feel free to just stand up there and go, hmm, let me think. And if you feel the need to, throw in a couple of, that's a really interesting, that's an interesting point. Let me just, let me think about that for a second. Yeah. You know, and the whole time you're thinking there, you might be saying to yourself, you know what, I have no idea what I'm going to tell them. Yeah. Is this, is this the time to go for the nuclear option? I'm not sure. Hmm. You know what, I think I will. So, you know, use the silence. Use the time. Don't feel the need to rush to a question. Again, we're not playing Jeopardy here where you got to get to that answer in the form of a question. Um, take your time. You'll look more intelligent for taking that time. All right, strategy number two. Uh, if you can't think of the answer, ask them to restate the question. So you might just simply ask them, oh, uh, can, you, can you restate the question, please? Uh, can you ask them? Can you ask that in a different way? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, what you're getting at can you can you you know say it in a different way or ask it in a different way and this will buy you time and this might actually give you the question in a form where it makes sense where you're where you say to yourself oh i get it now oh that's what you're asking well yeah i got an answer to that here we go so ask them to restate the question uh, another thing you can do is ask them to provide an example so you can say things like you know i'm not really sure if i understand what you're asking uh, can you give me an example of what you mean? Um, can you give me, you know, what were you thinking of uh, that led you to ask that question? And again, this is just a strategy to maybe get a little bit more information where you can then, you know, think of the answer. So again, these are strategies that you should practice. Practice this in the mirror. Practice this on your friends. Next time they ask you, oh, have you, uh, you know, have you binge watched, you know, the latest Netflix uh, show that just was released? Just give it a go. You know what? I'm not really sure um, uh, I understand what you're asking. Can you can you restate the question? Can you give me an example? Which which particular Netflix show are you talking about? You know, just kind of get into the practice. Try these out. You know, see which ones feel, uh, you know, feel the best for your particular style. All right. Strategy number three. Uh, and this is a great one, too, because it engages in dialogue and people love to have conversations. Ask them a question about their question. Right. So ask them. Uh, a question directly related to theirs, throw it back at them, right? So if they ask something like, you know, oh, do you think, you know, how do you think that this, uh, you know, this theory that you have would impact uh, children that are in the low socioeconomic bracket? And you might not know the answer. You might not know the implication, but you can always ask them a question about it. And you could ask them, well, could I, could I first ask you to, to, uh, to uh, you know, could I first ask you, why do you think socioeconomic st uh, statuses would be a factor? Um, you know, what, what's your opinion on why these children would be particularly vulnerable? Uh, what was the concern that brought this question up? You know, maybe we can get to it by that. Ask them a question about their question. And again, that'll engage you in a dialogue and you don't have to know the answer because you've thrown it back to them. You put it back into their court. And once again, that's a good way to deal with it. All right, strategy number four. Uh, you can answer your own question. And this is that nuclear option I was talking to you before. So if they ask you a question such as, uh, you know, what was the, um, you know, what was the statistics that you used in that meta analysis? Or, or can you tell me about the very specific details about that particular theory that you mentioned? You could just completely ignore that question and answer whatever it is that you want to talk about. And you can do that, you know, this relates to a, a more fundamental issue where, you know, that we need to address first. Uh, this brings up a, uh, a topic that needs to be, we need to be very clear on before we can answer that question. And then you can literally talk about anything you want. Any question that you were hoping that somebody would ask, you can stick in at this point. And uh, it will take them uh, away from uh, the question that they were asking, engage you in a dialogue, give you something that you absolutely know stone cold that you can talk about. And this is your nuclear option. Highly recommend practice this one. 
get used to it. So again, just try it out in your everyday life. Oh, did you binge watch the latest uh, the latest season of uh, Stranger Things? You know, and I think this relates to a more fundamental issue of how we consume media in our culture to begin with. You know, this binge watching thing, and then just go with it and see see what happens. See if your uh, if your friends actually pursue the original question. Nine times out of ten, they probably won't. All right, so those are some of the strategies to answer these questions. We're going to end today with uh, a little bit more uh, about how to uh, answer questions nicely. So one of the things that some students think about, especially when they're going to their first conference, uh, first um, conference, is that it's going to kind of be an adversarial approach. That there's going to be uh, questions that are attacking you, and it's going to be a hostile environment. And nothing can be further from the truth. Nothing can be further. They're usually very genial. They're usually very welcoming, very engaging, you know, ways to, to interact with, you know, fellow researchers. But at the same time, you want to make sure that you're contributing to that environment. So you want to be able to answer questions and answer them in a very nice way. Answer them in a way that might help to diffuse any hostility that might be brewing. So what are some of the strategies for this? Well, strategy number one uh, is flattery. Flattery is an option, right? Uh, it has a negative connotation to it sometimes, but it works. And one way to, uh, to engage in this, to disarm any particular hostile um, type of question, is to just admit, that's a really good question. You know, oh, wow, like, I, that's something I never even thought about. It's like, ooh, that's, you know, that is, that's super interesting. Oh, my goodness, I didn't even, wow, like that, ooh, I, I, I can't wait to, to look at that in the lab, you know, when I get back to my lab. All of these things, you know, wow, what a great idea type of responses will help to diffuse any sort of hostile situation. So have that again in your mind. When somebody asks a question, you might just want to start with, wow, that's a really good question. Ooh, what an interesting idea. Uh, you, you know what? I've never thought of that. You know, the implication being, wow, you must be really smart to have come up with that on your own. I didn't think about it and I'm the expert. So again, try that out. Great way to defuse any particular hostile situation. Strategy number two, thank them for the contribution, right? This is related to strategy number one. It's a little bit of that flattery, but tell them, you know what? I've never thought of that. I've, I've never even uh, thought about looking at that particular issue. I've, I, you know what? I've never heard of that researcher that you just mentioned. I'm going to have to, what's their name again? Let me just make sure I make a note. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You know, give them that sort of thank you for their help. You know, bring them into the bring them into your on your team. Wow, you know what? Thanks for that contribution. Thanks for that idea. I'm definitely going to look into it. Again, that's a nice way to tell them a particular answer. All right, and we're going to end now. I believe this is the end. It's so running a little over time, but again, we're going to make sure that we get the full experience in here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about nice versus mean questions, aka non-hostile versus sometimes hostile questions. So some questions are nice. And uh, these are the ones that you're, you're hoping people are going to ask you. So things like, you know, tell me about your views on this. Uh, tell me about uh, this particular aspect of your study. Uh, tell me about what you did, you know, to address this uh, concern. Uh, give me some more details about, you know, wh what it was that you, uh, you know, you're, those types of questions where you know it, you, it's answerable, you can go forward with it. Uh, and speculation questions. What do you think? about this? You know, what are your thoughts on this? Um, those are really open-ended. Those don't have any wrong answers, you know? So what do you think the implications of your study is? You could go anywhere. You could go education, uh, judicial system, uh, video game, like whatever it is. It's, it, these are the nice questions. These are the ones that are great to get. Sometimes though, the questions, and I'll admit this, can be a little bit mean. And these again, go back to those kind of unanswerable questions with a little side of hostility thrown in. So if you're doing a study on depression and you're doing a presentation on your on depression and your conclusion rubs somebody the wrong way, right? Your conclusion goes in the face of an expert who whose own theories contradict what you just presented. They might come up uh, against you with a question that is sort of designed to be a little bit hostile. So if they don't believe your depression results, they might ask you, well, how do you actually know that the BDI, the Beck's Depression Inventory, really measures depression? Like, how, are, how can you be sure? 
Maybe it's not measuring depression. And these questions are mean because they often invalidate your entire study. So if you based your entire study on Beck's depression inventory and they knock that leg out from under you, everything comes crashing down. And you basically have a study that is built on nothing. So these are the kind of questions that sometimes, you know, attack you at the heart of your study. So they typically attack things like operational definitions, like Beck's depression inventory is an operational definition of depression. Um, so these operational definitions, you know, how do you know that Beck's depression inventory measures this? How do you know that a uh, pre test post test uh, study is the best way to address this particular issue? Um, you know, how do you know that the the researchers that you uh, used for your conclusions uh, really did know what they were doing and really did kind of assess, you know, that phenomenon correctly? Those are those operational definition questions. And then the other type of mean questions is that they sometimes attack the basic assumptions of science. Like, how do you know your subjects can be trusted? How do you know they were actually doing the task that you presented on? Uh, how do you know that the theory you, you based your conclusions on is actually true, right? These are basic assumptions of science that cannot be answered. And that's one of the things that make these questions mean is that they just can't be answered. They're very hostile because there's no way of knowing. You cannot know. So once again, you have to deal with these questions. You're not going to get a lot of them. I'll be honest with you. Most conferences I've been to, very, very friendly. But occasionally you will get these, and especially important, you want to know that you can deal with them. So once again, remember the strategies. It is completely uh, fine to admit that you don't know for sure. It's completely fine to admit that they have a valid point. But then always bring them back to what it is that you concluded. So admit them. You know what? You, you don't know for sure if this theory is correct. But if it is correct, then here's this conclusion, right? If it is correct, then here's this big thing that I just found. You know, admit that you don't know for sure. You know what? I'm not really sure what, you know, the answer to that is. I'm not really sure how I can tell for sure that the Beck's depression inventory measures depression. But if it does, oh man, look at this thing here. Look at what I found. So tell them, admit that you don't know for sure, uh, and then bring them back to what you concluded. Bring them back to what your main point is, you control the narrative, bring them back to what it is the point that you want to uh, mention. All right, so that is it for what I wanted to cover for today, a little bit of catch up to uh, get us back on track. As we go forward, I'm gonna update the syllabus, I'm gonna put in new due dates, we're gonna make sure that we get this full experience in. I'm gonna try my hardest to make sure that we do have a poster session uh, and I'm going to give out details about how we're going to handle the uh, oral presentations, the PowerPoint presentations. I'm going to follow up on uh, what's going on with the URC. Uh, if you haven't already, it's not too late. Make uh, Put in your abstracts. Let's show them that there is that desire from the students, that grassroots swell uh, to save this uh, the URC. But uh, other than that, thank you for joining me for this first um, non-face-to-face uh, online class. And um, again, make sure that you keep up with the uh, lectures. I'll update the syllabus. And if you need to meet with me, uh, we I do have my office hours. They're online through the Zoom app. So look for that announcement. Uh, look for those links Tuesdays and Thursdays from 1.30 to 2.30. And also from 4 to 5, I'll be here waiting to help you with any questions uh, that you might have. Other than that, thank you for joining me for this uh, first online only uh, portion. And uh, let's continue to work on this very challenging time together to make sure that we can all get the most out of uh, the uh, what's left of our semester. All right, so take care and I'll see you next time.